everyone, it's Master Wong here today. It's a beautiful day, and I'm here with Pit Master. And you know, every time we hear for only one thing, we're here to give you the martial art training and everything to do with safety and keep you safe. That's what we're gonna do. But yesterday, I watching one is a, a um, documentary on the UFC about Chuck Liddell, and I just, you know, uh, the, the first time I ever see it, and I and I use the the man behind all this possible. So I'm taking this opportunity here to ask the man himself, Pip Master, what is uh, about that particular uh, the career of a Chuck Liddell. Okay, Pip Master, uh, full of the career, can you uh, uh, talk a little bit about it? Yeah, it was, uh, it was quite a ride. You know, I'm a martial arts guy, just like no different than today. And I've always wanted to keep people safe on the street and I want everybody to keep their lunch money. Um, so I opened a gym in my backyard because I was a registered nurse, um, working the night shift, you know, raising my family. Um, and then people started coming to my gym in the backyard and it started getting a little busier. And I'm working night shift. And I'm just trying to do this uh, for people to work out I, um, and have a, you know, have a good you know, workout, learn some martial arts and just pass on the art that I learned from my instructor back in Hawaii. And all of a sudden I get this guy that I actually had previously fought in a, in a kind of a challenge match. His name is Chuck Liddell. And we had a challenge match um, in our town because we were like the two guys, the two you know, fight guys. And people knew Chuck because he was a bouncer and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a college town and he was kind of popular for being the tough bouncer. He had a mohawk, you know, and he was a big guy. And so he was kind of known for being a fighter. And then I was like 20 minutes away um, and I was teaching out of my backyard and we had like the, you know, the skull and we had a, you know, our logo and we were kind of a tough place. So I was kind of known as a tough guy. So we're both kind of known as a tough guy in town. So somebody put it together so we could fight each other and see who was the toughest guy around. Oh, that, so that's what happened. That's what happened. That's how we met. And they put this, they matched us up and we had, I mean, we had a little match. It was like a, you know, it was kind of like a, kind of like a fight, you know, kind of. Um, and I ended up, just because I was more experienced than him, I ended up getting the best of it. And right after that, he had no ego. He just came right up to me and he said, can you be my trainer from now on? And I said, okay, yeah. Come tomorrow to my gym. I gave him my card. He showed up in my backyard the next day and, and we started training. You give him his, uh, your car, like driving car? No, my card, my business card. Oh, your business card. Yeah. But that's a funny story because I gave him my business card and he came to my gym the next day and started training. <clears throat> and it just so happened I was off work that day. And, uh, and it started pouring rain. Well, he, he actually got to my house on a motorcycle, a little right. beat up Honda motorcycle. And it was pouring rain. So, I, so after we were done training, I said, why don't you just take my car and go home? Because I don't, I don't have to work today. I'm, not gonna, I'm staying home. And he goes, I don't even, you don't even know me. You're going to let me borrow your car? I go, yeah, you're going to come back tomorrow and train, right? I, I, he goes, yeah. I go, why don't I you riding your motorcycle in the rain? He goes, okay, I'll see you tomorrow. So he took my car, and that's the first, I mean, that was the first day I knew him, but it was raining. I didn't want him to drive his motorcycle because it was like a 20-minute drive. So I gave him my car to drive home, and he came back the next morning, and we trained, and he never, it, it never stopped. Until you know, till you see the Iceman on pay-per-view. Right. So exciting. Now some of you see that Chuck Liddell going in and do loads of damage. You know, like uh, coming inside punching. This is like um, training with Pitmaster, like the left hook that he always, always talking about. And I never, never thought about it when he's talking about the left hook. How powerful is it? To when I watching Chuck Liddell doing loads of damage to the people, the punch, the fist. And Pit Master have a very, very, have a very passionate about the fist, how he going in and punch, and he's he the strike guy. And I just want to ask Pit Master, 
you when when you teaching him, he said you teaching a lot to do with the left hook, the body movement into the uh, 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 HK um, uh, Hawaiian uh, Kimbo to him, or you just teaching him a lot to do with fighting for the cage. Well, most most of it wasn't the case because when he first came and started training with me, I just wanted to train him. My whole goal when setting up the pit in my backyard was just to have a bunch of people and train together and have fun and you know, do barbecues and, you know, hang out. It had nothing to do with fighting because I didn't want anything to do with the fight business. I was already done with that. So I was just training the guys to have fun and, you know, learn self-defense and, and, and pass my art along. Um, so I wasn't teaching anything about fighting in a cage. But then he came to me and asked me, can I fight? I want to start fighting. Will you train me? And, uh, at first, I said, I was kind of hesitant because I was kind of over the fight career thing. And I was like, nah, man, I had a lot of fights. Let's just have fun and train. And, and, and you know, you, you get, you're getting your degree soon and you can get a job. And he's like, I really want to fight. I think I, I think I can be a champion. I really want to fight. And I was like, oh, shit. Okay, I'll train you. If you really want it, I'll train you. So from then on, we kind of had a goal for him to be a professional fighter and win a title. But the first couple of years was just training to have fun. Right. So, so, so when you started training with him uh, in your backyard, is he stay with you uh, the, uh, at your place or he just come in train and then he go back to work and then he come back to train again? Both, both. Uh, he had his own place in San Luis, but he would, he would sleep over at the house sometimes, uh, even sleep on the couch. He used to, and, and back then I had my kids, they were younger, um, and he would like help tutor them because they would bring home homework. He would help tutor them because he was really smart. He was, a, he was like a numbers genius. You know, he got his degree in accounting, and he was, I mean, he would easy, easily get a 4.0 without even studying. He was just, he had a mind for numbers. So he would help my kids uh, tutor, he would tutor my kids, and he would just, uh, he just trained there, but he had his own place in, uh, in San Luis Obispo, and he, uh, he worked as a bouncer and a bartender. Oh, wow. Very interesting. A lot of you don't know the backstory behind it. So now you can see all the movement, that, uh, techniques that Chocolate Joe go in. And, and I just see he going, when he start winning, he's so exciting. And Pitmaster come out and pick him up. And this, he, you know, uh, the, he, he's, uh, Pitmaster so uh, so sort of like um, emotional when you uh, when you get to see he's winning, and I want to ask him with Pitmaster, where did he find the name called the Ice Man? It's like who gave him that name? You did? Yeah, it was a. Uh, <clears throat> it was before one of his amateur fights. Um, he just had like no emotion, like uh, going into the fight and stuff. And a lot of his things, he just kind of treated like that, like, you know, kind of just like no emotion. Like, you just saw that, like, he'd have, like, you know, a lot of us, like, when we have issues with our life, girlfriends or whatever, we just kind of, you know, get like this. You know, I know you and I do. But uh, he was just always like this, like, not, nothing. Nothing seemed to phase him. Like, even going into a fight, you know, instead of, like, getting all riled up, he would just be like this. I said, bro, you don't have any emotion. You're like the Iceman. And I started calling him the Iceman. Oh, that's where the, the name come from? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's so interesting because most of you not, don't know why he called Iceman. Another thing as well is when he started training at your place and then uh, when he become the, the champion, when do you think that, uh, that how do you get yourself, get him into the UFC though? He just don't just get into the UFC like that. So how, how do you get him in there? Um, I just did the training and to be honest, like, um, uh, I just trained him, but he had other people like pushing him, um, his, his business side of it. I just took care of the training side of it. Right. So he had, he actually met Dana White before Dana White worked with the UFC and he, he liked Ve uh, Chuck loved to go to Vegas. He loved to, he would just take weekend trips to Vegas all the time. He loved, he loved Vegas. And he had some friends there, and um, 
um, he met Dana White. And Dana White was instrumental in getting him, you know, into the UFC. Uh, and then there was a guy named One Kick Nick who had a – he still has a gym in Vegas. He's actually uh, – he's actually still training fighters. Uh, Nick Bloomberg, and his, we call him One Kick Nick, and his gym is called One Kick Nick's. But it's in Vegas, and Chuck would go there and hang out and got to know them. And he just kind of – and Dana kind of got to know him um, and, and work with him, and he's the one that got him into the UFC. I just, I just trained him. I had nothing to do with his behind-the-scenes stuff. Right, right. So some of you watched some of the fight there. That you can see here. Some now you see that Chuck Liddell, when he coming in, he start to knock people out left, right, and center. I just love it when he start to fight with uh, Tito. Uh, he come in, bam, bam, bam. And then literally, uh, Tito haven't got a chance to cover up, and he just going in like... Like the mad dog, you know, like guapo of them. Like he have so much passion when he get in, like guapo of you. He not let go at all. And and after 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 watching Fuen as the fight uh, the go on, he get knocked out quite often. And I'm, and I don't really understand the problem. And then you start to say that something about uh, is you don't teach him right and stuff like that. So uh, can you tell them what is a what little bit about because I haven't uh, know from from your side. Yeah, well, um, Chuck, like, like some fighters don't have a chin. Like, they don't have a good chin. That means you get knocked out easily. And um, when you got knocked out easily, I mean, there's certain things you have to do <clears throat> because you can't just get in there and bang like Chuck does. Chuck went in and banged. So he, he had to have a good chin. Because if you go in there and trade with people, you're always going to, you're going to get caught no matter what. Like, you're going to get caught. You're never not going to get caught. The only way you don't get hit is like fighting like Floyd Mayweather, moving a lot. Chuck right. didn't like to move. He just wanted to go straight in. So fighters like that are just like swimmers. They're always going to get wet. They're, these guys are always going to get punched. Right. So that worked well for Chuck when he had a chin. But something that happens to fighters, not all fighters, but some fighters have a good chin, but then they lose it throughout their career after they've been hit enough. And that's what happened to Chuck. He lost his chin. So I tried to train him different ways to get around not getting hit all the time. But he wouldn't listen. He just wanted to always just go in and bang. And, and he didn't have the chin for it anymore. So towards the end of his career, he could have, like, moved more and done more takedowns. And, and, but he would have been less exciting. But he would have won. Because he was the great wrestler and he was great at jiu-jitsu. Right. But he only wanted to put the, put the big fight on for the fans. So he did not want to uh, – um, he didn't want to sacrifice his, his, his exciting fighting style for maybe winning. He'd rather go out slugging than win wrestling. Right. So, so that cost him towards the end of his career. He lost like six of his last seven fights because, because he chose – to give, you know, the fans, you know, what they wanted. He, he banged. He, and he didn't care about the chin. So I, I blamed myself towards the end because I felt like I should have made him fight a certain way, even though we trained cert a certain way for certain, you know, towards the end of his career. But he just, he wouldn't listen. As soon as he hit the guy once, he would just, you see in his eyes, that I would think, oh, shit. Because we had a certain style where he'd be moving more, his hands are up. But as soon as he landed a punch, you could just see it. He would drop his hands, and he would just start slugging. And then we'd, I'd be like, oh, shit. Then he'd, he'd get hit. And as soon as he got hit towards the end of his career, he just didn't have the chin, so he'd get knocked out. So what made him the greatest, you know, one of the greatest fighters, maybe not technically, but the people's champion of all times, actually was his downfall, his his uh, – his, his, his willingness to slug it out with anyone. So it made him, but then it ended his career. Right, right. So we basically do it for the fan. Oh, he loved the fan. Yeah, he, his fans were everything to him. And um, man, people loved him. P part of the reason people loved him is because they knew they could see him in Vegas and come up to him. And he would talk to them for like, he would talk to them like they were his best friend. He would sign the autograph, he'd take his picture. And I've seen UFC guys now, like, nah, I don't want to take a picture. No, I can't do the autograph. I'm in a hurry. 
he was never once in a hurry. He was never once too busy to stop and talk to a fan, take pictures with a fan or whatever. He was never. And the fans could tell. He was a blue-collar guy. He was just a – he was a down, down-to-earth working guy. He never got that, like, oh, I'm too good for you kind of thing. And a lot of UFC guys now do get that. And that's one of the reasons Chuck's resonated with his fan base. Right, right. He's a, the, the, uh, uh, when I saw him, he spent a lot of time, like you mentioned, onto the documentary. Spent a lot of time, about three hours, signing all, grab all around uh, one of the, the stadium or something. That you walk around was, and sign all the crap. It was the Super Show, like we're going. Right. And it was packed. It was at the MGM, and they had like a huge UFC that weekend. He wasn't fighting. But he came into my booth. I had a booth. Right. And he came into my booth and like 10,000 people like followed him to that booth. And there was a line like all the way through the MGM casino. And it's like he was signing autographs for hours. And we're like, he was starving, but he would not stop. So like we were saying, come on, let's go eat. He goes, no, I got to finish. I still got people. We had to go get him lunch. And he would like eat his sandwich while he was signing autographs. Because he wanted everybody in that line to get their autograph and picture. Wow, wow. So, some of you out there haven't seen some of the bit yet, here's the bit for that. Check it out. Now some of you see that Chuck Liddell is not the people uh, people champion. Not that he's very good at what he's doing, and he have the passion of fighting. Also, he have a very good character. You know, he's he spent time with the uh, <clears throat> all the uh, fan and everyone else's because. It just learn from the right master. You know, the master teach you right, then you always have the right mindset. I want to ask it to you to do this, a pit master. Near to the end of his career, when he's fighting, uh, did you spend time to teaching him then, or we have some different trainer? Because somehow the last fight, it just don't really go down very well on that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I worked with him at the end of his career, except for his very last fight. The very last fight, um, we didn't see eye to eye on taking that fight. Um, I felt, I felt, um, um, and this is, and I'm sorry for saying this because it's disrespectful and I, I mean no disrespect to Tito because I think Tito is a, a really great uh, fighter and he's a great ambassador to uh, the MMA world and the UFC. But to me, like Chuck already knocked him out twice. So I didn't see, I didn't, I didn't like that fight because it's a no win, you know, like, if Chuck loses, you lost to Tito, someone you knocked out twice. And if you win, you beat a guy you already beat twice. Because it, to me, it was kind of like fucking the fat chick. You know, it's like, <laughs> why do you want to fuck her again? You know, so it's like, and, I, and I'm sorry I said it that way because I'm not showing, I'm, 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 I'm making a metaphor for the fight. Nothing, no, no, no ding on Tito. But that's how I felt it, it was. And I was against it. I was up, you know. I, I wanted Chuck to keep his legacy, um, and I felt losing to Tito would severely um, affect his, his his legacy in a negative way. And I and I didn't want him to get hurt. So I just didn't like that fight at all. So my negativity towards that fight, you know, he went out. His wife went out and got another training team, um, and they trained, you know, in LA. And I didn't I didn't have anything to do with that last fight at all. No. So, so he didn't contact you then and ask you for advice and anything like that? We talked a couple times dur during the beginning of his training for that fight, and I was going to come down and help him. But for some reason, I, I don't think his wife wanted me to, and, and, and I think the coach that he, they hired for that fight didn't, you know, had kind of an ego thing, and he didn't want me getting involved. 
because you know he wanted to be the guy um so it just didn't work out that way and i told chuck i don't agree with this fight i don't want i you know i don't want i don't think you should take this fight but if you're really gonna take it i'll be there for you and if you need me to train you i'll train you and if you need me to be in your corner i'll be in your corner um but it seems like his wife orchestrated his training camp and and he had his own training camp and she said we don't really need you here we got it all covered right that's that's quite we, that's we quite sad. Was covered. that's quite sad isn't it because you the you you ping them up uh, him up and then start training him you know how he fighting style like and you spend a lot of time you know how he move what he should shouldn't do you know his bad habit what he what he could have and bad habit is you you know all that and nobody better than 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 you to explain and show him yeah yeah i don't, I don't think uh i don't think she fully understood the uh the dynamics of 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 our relationship so i mean and for some reason she was in charge of that training camp so it just it didn't work out the way uh anyone wanted i was heartbroken i'm sure they were heartbroken it was it was a heartbreaking fight you know and and tito did great he stepped up and 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 even t tito after the fight said uh he thinks that chuck would have done a lot better if i was in his corner right so some of you watching the end bit and you see how the the fight it end and everything else so this is the last bit on it check it out and anything you want to ask pitmaster about any information about training ufc fighting anything else then let us know and you know all of you did know that me and pitmaster have the group the secret group called hk free okay hk free mini uh, HK3 is the training um, so plus secret group. So we're going to there to helping you to be the better version of yourself. Uh, Pitmaster, want to add something on that one? No, I just watched this fight. You'll, uh, Chuck will always go down in history as one of the main guys bringing the UFC up to where it is today and, and, uh, and well-deserved and uh, wish him the best. And, uh, and he's one of the legends in our, our sport and our system of HK3 is one of our he's one of our highest ranking members of, of our system HK3. Wow. So, check this out and I will see you all soon. Out.